Here we go. Greetings from RNDC. We're hoping all hundred of you have joined us today and thank you so very, very much for taking time out of your busy selling day. And thank you to Joe Gardner for helping us set up this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm Eugenia Keegan and I'm the general manager in Oregon for Jackson Family Wines. Mm -hmm. And I have the honor of moderating this webinar today. Uh, for those of you who are listening, if you have questions or comments, please send them our way. We have the Q&A, of course, for questions, which uh, Carrie, who is on here, no, we do, do we see her? Ah, she's uh, blocked herself out from Rex Hill, who will be answering those. And of course, the chat is open too, if you want to uh, add any comments. There she is. Thanks, Carrie. Um, so why are we here today? What prompted this? Well, May is Oregon Wine Month. I know you all know that May is Oregon Wine Month. Why is May Oregon Wine Month? No particular reason. It's a great, great month. And in fact, though, there was a, uh, as, as usual in Oregon, a like-minded group of uh, vintners who decided that they uh, should probably start to sell and market together. Oregon is super, super small. We need to remind people that we are only about 1.4 or 1.5% of the domestic wine business, but we punch way above our weight. And we love to brag about our wine spectator scores uh, that we are 17% last year of the 90 plus scores. And that's just one statistic that we could give you, but it's one of many that just try and set you up to understand what great wine we make. What is funny, however, is that group of like-minded vintners decided that this May thing had to be official. So in 2012, then Governor Kitzhopper signed a declaration that indeed May is Oregon Wine Month. But it is an opportunity for all of us to rally around this one month to really focus on and promote Oregon wines. Obviously, we want you selling, buying, drinking Oregon wines in all 12 months, but May's our opportunity to really focus on this. So we're celebrating, uh, we, we celebrated 50 years a couple of years ago as an industry, and we have uh, some of our pioneer wineries that are actually celebrating 50 years of being in business. It's a very exciting time, and we're honored to have two of those pioneer wineries with us today. So 50 years, it, does it seem like a long time or a short amount of time? Well, obviously in the context of the world wine business, it's a very short period of time. But for those of us in Oregon, it can feel like a long period of time. And for those who grew up in this industry, this nascent industry, and had to put up with their parents being called hippies and crazy and, any, uh, and many things that we're not gonna repeat today, um, they have a very special and particular perspective on this industry. And with us today as a second generation wine grower and co-owner co manager with his sister, Allison from Sokol Blosser Winery is Alex Sokol Blosser. Alex, good morning. Hello, Eugenia and everybody else on this call. Yes. Can you talk to us a little bit about growing up in this biz and sitting around those dining room tables while your folks and the other crazy hippies were putting this industry together? Yes. I just want to be straight up that growing up in the wine industry is not normal. It's not a normal growing up. And the, the culturally creative people that I grew up with um, around these tables, going to these parties, it was, it was a little crazy. And it was almost like we have different people in the Muppet show that are around this table. And I, you know, it, it was just, it was fun. It was exciting. It was international. You know, every time harvest came around, we're working with people from all over the world. Um, and the collaboration was amazing. You know, the collaboration is really something that my family working with Adelsheim's, Ponzi's, Bullstex, um, Erath's, um, I mean, there's just there's so Campbell's. many Camp Campbell's the, and so it's just, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it wasn't normal. And, but that collaboration has fueled um, the dynamicism that we see today in the industry. I mean, these days it's not just small family operations. We have large wineries making extremely high quality wine that we can get out into the, into the world. It's, it's exciting. So 
are we allowed to call you crazy, Alex? Like the upbringing that you had? I think you should. You're on this uh, call would probably nod in some. Agreement. Yeah, it's it wasn't normal. So I'm, I'm and I'm fully willing to say it's, I'm not normal. And yes, it's uh, it is crazy. Very so, gypsy ish circus. So behind, behind you is a photo with two very, very handsome young boys. Yes. That are now young men. Have they grown up in the crazy wine industry with you as well? Yes, the background is, uh, this is on my right shoulder, this is my uh, twin son, Avery, and this is my left shoulder, this is Nicholas. This is, they're working a harvest, and they're just, you know, at that age, they're now graduating from high school this year. But they were shuffling stems coming out of the distemmer. And, you know, our hope here at Circle Blaster is we can maybe get it to the third generation. So Are you, are you paying them yet? Uh, we weren't paying them then. Now, yes. Yes, okay. they can They can put in a good day's work and... Um, Avery is really good at driving forklift. So uh, he worked a lot of hours this last harvest. Excellent. Thank you so much, Alex. As I said, we had two pioneering families with us today. And uh, one of the things that was important for these early pioneer winemakers was quality, a quality statement. We talk about yields in Oregon. And uh, on the average in Oregon, we get about three tons of the acre. The, the most expensive, the number one cost of putting a bottle of wine together is the cost of the raw material. So if you can get six tons of the acre, you've just cut that cost in half. And we cannot ripen six tons of the acre. It's three tons of the acre is basically the average in Oregon. And unfortunately that does drive some of our costs up, but quality was always the, the underlying principle, understanding that we were gonna make small amounts of very, very exclusive wine. And some of that early work was done by pioneers to really upgrade the industry. And uh, for those of you who are old timers, like I am, you will remember back to the 70s when, in fact, varietal labeling was 51%. So I could put in the bottle a wine called Chardonnay, and it only had to be 51% Chardonnay. It could be 49% Chenin Blanc or French Colombard or whatever else I had sitting around the cellar. So some very quality minded people got together and said, that's ridiculous. And in fact, however, there was one very large winery, yet unnamed, who decided that they liked the 51% rule. So they compromised at 75%. So the federal rule right now for varietal labeling is 75%. That's all that's required. But the Oregon winemakers decided that there needed to be a much higher quality standard for varietal labeling. And that was led by David Adelsheim. And with us today from Adelsheim Vineyard is CEO and president, Rob Alstron. Rob, can you tell us a little bit about that history and what that's meant to the industry for us? Thanks, Eugenia. Hello, everyone. Uh, sure, it's uh, it's really quite remarkable, really, um, and it's it's almost like contrary. And people think you get Chardonnay and it's Chardonnay, but um, to your point, it's been uh, oftentimes a, a mix. So, I think there's a lot of uh, transparency and authenticity to what we're doing here in Oregon. Um, and I will comment too that this is the real sky. I probably shouldn't have shown it because we think it's rainy and cold here and all my peers here are indoors because it's like, uh, what's this thing? Uh, but uh, it, 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 is, it is about quality. It's about um, responsibility. It's about truthfulness in what we're doing. And, and that's really vital. And it, it not only is about uh, the varietal blend, but it's about sense of place. It's, um, it's about how we take care of our people. Um, it's, it's a much bigger story that includes a lot of foresight to think ahead, uh, to protect the place, to protect the, the labeling truth. And, uh, you know, hats off to these uh, pioneers that really did it like David Adelsheim and, and many others here uh, on the call. Um, so yeah, it's amazing their ability to see that far uh, ahead um, when they were, they weren't from the wine industry. It wasn't like they had a background in this and they were making this all up as, as they went along. They didn't have any money. They didn't have business degrees. They didn't know what a business plan looked like and what they had was passion and uh, commitment and each other. And I think that's, that's the basis of pretty much what we, what we have today. Uh, we're often called uh, uh, rock lickers and tree huggers up here. And um, I think the, the green and sustainability is a, it's, it's a part of the world that we're growing into, but for the Oregonians, this is a way of life. And everything we do each day, we look around us to see how we can be better at, at what we do. 
And one of the things that we created here in Oregon is called LIVE, L-I-V-E. And in fact, it's a uh, Swiss organization originally, and we borrowed the prototype. But it is a bottom-up, meaning the wine grower and the uh, research uh, uh, researchers that we have at the university who are looking at sustainability in our vineyards and uh, uh, what we can do collectively to solve problems in a very sustainable and, and soft way. LIVE was created in 1999 and it focused on vineyards at that time. But after they managed to rope in most of the vineyards into LIVE certification, it is a third party certification, they moved to wineries. And the first winery that was LIVE certified in Oregon was Willa Kenzie Estate. And with us today is Alex Nichols, the associate winemaker at uh, Willa Kenzie, to talk a little bit about LIVE and sustainability at Willa Kenzie. Alex, good morning. Good morning, Eugenia. Uh, yeah, so as, as Eugenia said, Willa Kenzie was the first live certified winery in Oregon. Uh, at this point for live, there are 38 wineries involved. Actually, I think everybody uh, on the screen here in some capacity is, is either live certified or involved with live certified vineyards, which is really cool. And I think a, a great reflection of where we are as an industry and the role that sustainability plays in our industry. Uh, one of the things that I think we all think about with live and one of the drivers behind it is continuous improvement. And year over year, we're always looking to, to see what we can do to simply move the needle uh, in, in terms of a sustainability direction. At Willa Kenzie Estate, uh, the things that we have going for us right now, we've had solar panels in since 2008 that have been providing uh, powered back to the grid and offsetting a lot of our usage. And most recently, we went through a fairly uh, substantial winery renovation that reduced our uh, water usage and electrical usage by over 30% uh, year over year. So for the last five years, we've, we've been able to cut down pretty dramatically. Uh, and a lot of that is just simply leveraging new technology that's available uh, and, and doing things as simple as switching out light bulbs to all LEDs, getting more efficient chilling and heating systems, and uh, even something as simple as, as pressure washing instead of, instead of rinsing floors, which we all do so very much during harvest. Uh, so there are all these little things that we can be doing on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, but also bigger projects like uh, like infrastructure that can can really move the needle for sustainability, uh, help us continue to make great wines in this region for we possibly can. You know, Alex, you bring up a good point about continuous improvement, and that's one of the beauties of live. There's no finish line. You can't you can't get to the end game. It's always about doing better, and we we keep moving the the goalposts every every time we uh, open up the books because the goal is to just keep Im improving. You know, we 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 think of sustainability with vineyards, of course, and agriculture. Alex just addressed uh, what you can do in the winery, but there is such a thing as sustainability in business. And uh, Oregon has now eight B Corp wineries, but the first B Corp winery was Rex Hill A to Z. And today we have with us executive winemaker, Michael Davies, who was a part of the spearheading of pulling uh, A to Z Rex Hill into being the first B Corp in Oregon. Uh, good morning, Michael, welcome. Morning, Eugenia. Thanks very much for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone from across the country. Uh, I wish I could see you all, but I, I know there's a lot of you out there. Um, so yes, at A to Z in Rex Hill, uh, we chose B Corp certification. Uh, we are quite proud to be the first winery in the world to, be, to achieve uh, B Corp certification in 2014. Um, and we did it simply because it was the right thing to do. Um, we felt strongly that uh, B Corp certification is a way, is a, it presents a comprehensive approach to sustainability and inclusivity. Um, we're excited that an increasing number of other wineries around Oregon have already and are pursuing B Corp certification. Uh, we, we believe in it. We think it's a very meaningful program. Uh, the certification criteria is rigorous. Uh, for us, it speaks effectively not only to the importance of a healthier environment, but stronger communities, uh, which I think we all, we all on this call and, and, and all of you care about, of course doing right by the people involved, the planet, of course, and also respecting, as Eugenia was saying, the economic mission of the business. If we go out of business, we can't help protect the environment and we can't help build stronger communities. Uh, 
So during Oregon Wine Month, um, we are focused primarily on our boutique and legacy Rexel brand, which fits under the large umbrella of A to Z Wineworks. Uh, when A to Z purchased Rexel um, at the end of 2006, we, we decreased case production by 80%. And in this way, found it pretty easy to incorporate things like biodynamic and organic viticulture into our Rex Hill program. A little bit harder at the A to Z level, but we're still working on it. We, we, like Alex was just saying, we believe in continuous improvement. We're striving, we're persuading, we're cajoling, uh, encouraging, subsidizing, whatever it takes our growers to sort of to, to approach the business in this way. So if you're not familiar with B Corporations, I highly encourage you to go to bcorporation.net. Uh, there's a lot of impressive companies from around the world on that uh, website. Uh, and in that way, we believe in being a force for good and that think our, the B Corp status helps us get there. So thanks for your attention. Look forward to seeing you all in Oregon next time around. So all the very best. Yeah, M Michael, thank you. Uh, you know, it's it's just the, again the the idea of continuous uh, improvement, and um, one of the things that we haven't talked about as much is how the social responsibility is part of these programs, and and it, all of these certifications are a lot of time and effort. They're not financially very expensive, but they take a lot. The, the work it does is financially, uh, takes takes financial uh, investment, but the certification part is the rigor of the paperwork, but it helps us, it reminds us all the time as we're doing that work to be focused on this stuff. So it's kind of our way as we do our annual certifications of reinvigorating our commitment to what we're doing. And social responsibility is an enormous part of our obligation to the people that make this whole project work for us, from the people in the vineyard all the way to those of you who are out there selling wine for us, and hopefully everybody that's drinking our wine as well. Um, back a little bit to, to the farming part of it, which is one of the areas where sustainability is where we start. It's where our products start. It starts in the vineyard. It starts with the grapes. And uh, we talked about live a little bit. And of course, there's organic and biodynamic, which are also certifications. And one of, uh, I think, our, our largest biodynamic farmer in, uh, in Oregon is King Estate. And Justin King, a uh, family owner and uh, national sales manager, is here to talk about biodynamics on 1,500 acres or more. It's a, it's a big number, Justin. It's not, a small, it's not a small investment or a small project. Help us understand that. Absolutely. Thanks, Eugenia. And thanks for, for, for wrangling this whole crew. Um, so, um, you know, King Estate had been, has always been farming organically. And I think like, uh, like Michael had mentioned, you know, a lot of times you have folks who are either thinking about farming organically or maybe they are farming organically, but they haven't actually gotten, gone ahead and gotten certified. That's pretty, that's a really common story. It, it took us till 2003 to actually get certified organic by Oregon Tilth. Um, and then in two, 2016, sort of between 2003 and 2016, we realized, you know, there's, there's even more to do here. Um, you know, um, and we thought about, well, you know, how do we kind of take it that step further, you know, to Eugenia's point, we're always looking to improve every year to kind of re recommit to, to our kind of mission. And biodynamics was something that was, uh, was on our radar because we were already farming very much that way. Um, the property is 1,033 acres. Uh, in 2016, we were certified by Demeter as biodynamic. It made us uh, the largest biodynamic vineyard property in, in America, in North America. Um, and we have, uh, you know, essentially uh, just continued to try to enrich that process uh, each year since. So we have about half of the vineyard under vine, the other, uh, excuse me, half the property under vine. And then the other half of the property are, are the other inputs that we're looking for. You know, you've got fruit and vegetable gardens, you've got orchards, uh, there are an, a, a myriad of animals on the property at this point, lots of sheep, lots of a crazy amount of turkeys. Um, if anybody needs to go turkey hunting, come, come visit us. Um, uh, you know, we got some cattle on the property as well, et cetera, et cetera. So really what you're looking for are all these kind of inputs. And, and I'm going to use a kind of an analogy and it might be sort of a, a stretch, but I'm just going to try it. You've ever had like a factory egg and then like a farm egg and you see the color of the yolk on the factory egg and it's that really light, light yellow. And then you see the color of the yolk on the, on the farm egg. Well, the difference in that is, is a diversity of vitamins, a diversity of, of, of inputs into the chicken. <laughs> uh, 
and and and, and we we like our 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 king of state wine to be the more like the farm the farm chicken um and so that's kind of how we approach it and it really it's so it, so it is about commitment to sustainable agriculture about stewardship of our property but it's also about making the wine better it's about making the wine feel more alive um in the bottle so um there are just you know so many good reasons to do it um so i'll i'll, I'll leave it there <laughs> All right, with so many good reasons to do it. Yeah. The whole farm approach. Yeah, the whole farm approach. Yes. Um, I need to come down not to go turkey hunting, but to um, have some of those veg fresh vegetables. Don't yes, need turkey. there we go. I'm with you on that. <laughs> one, of, uh, one of the things that's uh, a benefit of being uh, small and, and you know, Oregon has really come to the world stage in the last uh, decade or so. And there were years, of course, of many people building this industry uh, before it was as well known as it is now and well respected and with wines available all over the all over the world. And so it's been a mecca for younger winemakers to join this community and bring their passion, their commitment and their new ideas. And um, and yet there is a deep respect for the pioneers and what they started uh, those 50 years ago. And one of those innovators is Ryan Harms. And Ryan runs a Union Wine Company, is the founder and owner. Uh, but he also uh, went out of his way to buy Amity, one of our icon brands, when it came up for sale, showing that deep respect for those who came before him and uh, worked this land and made the Oregon wine industry what it is. But we can't stop now. We have to innovate and go forward. Ryan's one of our key innovators, and I'd like him to talk about the things he's doing at his winery. Thanks, Eugenia. It's great to uh, see everyone, uh, especially given the last year that we've all had and not had our regular touch points. Um, Oregon Wine Month is always such an awesome opportunity for us to celebrate. And here at Union, we are, and I think interesting to hear everyone that there's a common thread that I think we keep coming back to is kind of the land sustainability. And even though a cornerstone for us has been innovating within the wine space, uh, launching wine in a can, uh, which I think at the end of last year was now a 200 plus million dollar category. Um, so pretty awesome to be a part of creating uh, a new package and a new space within uh, our industry. But I think also thinking about the recyclability, the sustainability of that particular package and that seems to be very much this morning a through thread if if i'm listening to so many of the wineries on this call kind of talking about uh, how we actually show up um, whether it is from a farming standpoint to our social and community responsibilities uh, so for oregon wine month union wine company has a give back initiative that we're focused on uh, the nature conservancy is receiving a fifty thousand uh, dollar donation from us and we're very focused uh, uh, starting with uh, Earth Day, uh, which was just what last week, um, you know, through the rest of the summer to uh, really promote what's going on with the Nature Conservancy, and and we're very excited uh, uh, about being able to work with them. So that's kind of our both our sustainable focus for um, from us as a winery, but also it's all tied around uh, two of our cans uh, that have a limited edition print on them. So. That is truly awesome. And uh, that we had to come here today to hear about that great gifting program that you're doing. Uh, it was worth the phone call. That is incredible, Ryan. Thank you so much. It's an example of your giving back all the time. And you do it every day in small ways. And uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, pretty exciting. We Something else that we learned in getting together to talk about this seminar that completely blew me away, and others too, because we had to gossip about it after the fact was the work that's being done at Willamette, uh, Willamette Valley Vineyards. And their innovation in the vineyard is so exciting and creating a complete new model for us going forward. And I'm so excited for Christine Clare, who is the managing director of the winery to tell us what that is about. Christine, please. Thank you, Eugenia. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, one of the things we're working on now is something that we really learned during the pandemic. Uh, so when our tasting rooms were shut down, just like a lot of the accounts um, 
that our distributors work with that are on this call, you know, we were really concerned about the safety of our teams and our guests when we were set to reopen. And so we invested in UVC light uh, technology that was developed by NASA to essentially just purify the air um, using you know, that light and it was proven to kill the coronavirus. And it was from that work that our founder, Jim Bruneau, uh, started reading and in reading about how UVC light could be used in other applications. And one of those was to consider how it could be used in dealing with our grape's biggest disease pressure, which is powdery mildew and um, in, in killing uh, a fungus. And so we uh, very um, uh, uh, kind of amateurly built some UVC light panels. They look like tanning beds that can be mounted to our tractors and they run um, the vine rows, but it has to be done at night when the cells of the powdery mildew, um, their defense mechanisms are off um, at night. And so we were working night shifts starting around 10 p.m. running this light through the vineyards working with Oregon State University and Washington State to collect data and to see its effectiveness. And um, so it was the first commercial use. And um, in just yesterday, we got our first robot so that we'll be able to have a driverless option so that we don't have to be working 24 hours a day to, to do this anymore. Um, but it, it just landed here in Oregon from Norway. And so we're going to continue to prove this and really, you know, our goal here is to just show um, that, you know, while we at the winery are only using organic sulfur, our hope is that this type of technology really revolutionizes all of agriculture by reducing the use of harmful fungicides and chemicals completely. And um, while being very cost effective, because that's what it will take for widespread adoption. Um, so, uh, you know, Please come out to our state vineyards. You're going to see some really bright lights work in the vineyards this year. And, um, and hopefully, you know, I know where all these other vineyards are on the screen. We'll be, we'll bring it over too. That's it's, thank you, Christine. That is just so amazing. That is so cutting edge technology and solving problems that we have in very thoughtful uh, in innovative ways and also very, very gentle ways, very, very light on the earth ways. It's, it's really remarkable and I can't wait to come see that, that work uh, for myself. It's, it's really awesome. Virginia, is that another term for UFO? It can be an un unidentified farming object. Oh, I love that. Oh, thank you. Oh God, somebody's going to run, run with that one or fly with that one, I should say. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Rob. That's um, a dad joke, Rob. Yeah, I know. I have plenty of them. Don't worry. <laughs> so, so, uh, so we try and talk seriously about collaboration, which gets a little silly when you when you talk to a group like this. But community is a very important part of what we do, and um, we are in agriculture, and it is us. It is man against nature, and we have to band together. And and those early pioneers, you know, had those. They had to share crusher stemmers and presses, and most of us uh, have our own now. Where we've all grown up. But community is a very big part of it. And, and community is not just about those that are here, but it's about welcoming those that want to be here. And we were honored in 1988 to welcome Domaine Duran from Burgundy. Uh, we call them DDO, Domaine Duran, Oregon. That's their name for us. But they have been an incredible participant in the Oregon wine industry. And I think they call it Oregon Soil French Soul, which could not be a more perfect tagline for them. And they've brought over a bunch of other Burgundians, and we thank them dearly for that. Uh, with us today is their winemaker, Aaron Bell. And he, Aaron is going to talk to us a little bit about working for DDO and bringing the, bringing the French to, uh, to Oregon. Hello, Aaron. Good to see you. It's been a while. Good morning, everybody. Um, yes, I mean, community, honestly, if there's one reason um, that the Jordans came here uh, was the, the sense of community they felt when they first came to IPNC. The International Pinot Noir Celebration in the summer of 1987. That was really kind of the sealing deal. Um, that and some good pushing by uh, by Mr. Adelsheim to uh, to invest in Oregon. So community is uh, you know it's. I grew up in Oregon. I grew up in Newburgh, Oregon. So ironically, I uh, I work have worked for the Drun family for 20 years. 
Um, and I, I grew up 10 miles from where the winery is. So a sense of community is really felt in Oregon for me, for sure. But um, that is something that is just uniquely special um, in Oregon. And that's the reason they came. That's the reason we stayed. And there's so many things that have been created in Oregon um, by the, the, you know, the Oregon wine community, IPNC um, being one, Oregon Pinot Camp, OPC being another to spread the gospel uh, through the nation, but now through the world about what we're doing and what we believe is, is, is special here. Um, and salute, you know, salute, we all know, we all depend on migrant worker um, to, to help us do what we do as far as our farming and the quality of farming that we're doing. And so salute is an organization created in 1991 to uh, provide healthcare for migrant workers and uh, not, just, not just vineyard workers, but any, any uh, migrant worker of any agricultural uh, throughout, throughout Oregon. Um, and uh, so there's just some, some things that the, the community does, you know, often when, when I travel, for, well, when, when I travel again for the winery, we all travel again for the wineries. Um, when we do events together, it is funny. I often hear this saying that, and you guys really do like each other quite a bit. Um, and I do think it's something quite special. We could say, you know, I've heard also where you guys are kind of like a pack and I, uh, we are, uh, we believe in what we're doing very, very much. And uh, hopefully you guys do as well. So uh, we want to celebrate May and uh, let's uh, eat, drink, uh, Oregon Pinot Noir. So thank you. Thanks, Aaron. And thank you to the Durands for, for, for bringing their French soul over to our Oregon soil. It's been a great collaboration and we, 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 love, their, we love their visits and we love having the opportunity to go over to Burgundy, of course, and, and visit with them. Uh, as, as we evolve, uh, you know, we've talked about pioneer spirit, we've talked about live and how we've uh, evolved with sustainability. And we work very hard to have a diverse uh, and thoughtful workforce and to take care of our workforce. And uh, with us today is Melissa Burr, uh, head winemaker at Stoller. And Stoller has grown considerably. Uh, they, uh, they bought Shehalem Winery and so they have added that to their portfolio. Um, I think there's a fabulous project, Melissa, that you're working on that I'd love you to speak to that honors the history of what we do in Oregon and what has happened in Oregon long before some of those pioneers got here, in fact. And so, Melissa, please take it away. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, it's an honor to be here. And just listening to everybody on this panel just like reinforces my appreciation and love for this industry. And we could talk, all of us could talk for a long time about a lot of things about sustainability and collaboration, at quality, pioneering, inclusion. And I think in, it, in all of that, there's a lot of passion. So when I think about Oregon and what makes us special, it's all these people here and it's, you know, we're such a small producing state, but there's just an enormous amount of passion and dedication amongst all of us here. So again, I can really feel it on this call and it makes me really you know, proud to be a part of all this. And personally, you know, I've been with Stoller for almost 20 years. I came on in 2005 as the head winemaker. And at that time I was quite a bit younger, no surprise, 20 years ago. But the point is when I came on um, being a woman, I got a lot of comments about that. Like, oh, wow, you're a woman winemaker or, hey, where's your boss? Where's the winemaker type of a thing? And um, that, was, that was then and I was proud, but I'm even more proud today to be in this industry as a woman. And when I think about Willamette Valley, I know that our region is one of the most um, women represented regions in the world. And Willamette Valley has a lot of women winemakers compared to other areas. I can't quote exact statistics, but I know that at least 30% now of winemakers are women and it's growing rapidly. It's a fantastic career for both men and women. And that's something again, to be very proud of. And then I think makes Oregon stand out. I know Christine has a, a lot of women on her team. A lot of us do. And at Stoller, which now is a Stoller wine group, like Eugenia mentioned, it's grown tremendously. When I started in 2005, I made wine for Stoller family estate, less than 1000 cases. And now the wine group represents five different brands. And we have five winemakers, five head winemakers, and three of the five are women. And then on our production team, we have exactly 50% men and women. And it's not done by a whole lot of, you know, just you have to be a woman or not to be on this team. We've just grown that way. And it's something that works very well with us. And a lot of balance is there. And again, just really proud to be 
a part of that, and I think it's neat that our, our valley has such a high amount of women winemakers and it's growing. So yes, and then just to last, to just touch on Eugenia's uh, comment about our brands, our five brands as part of the wine group. I am co-owner, I started a project called History Wines and I get to work with growers across Oregon and Washington that have some of the oldest vines in, in our area. And just thinking about the age of vineyards and we started the conversation about these pioneers 50 years ago started these things. And yes, that's a long time, but not that long, but our industry is, is so young. So it's just exciting to work with these growers and, and showcase these wines and this brand called History. So that's one of the five brands that I'm a part of. So thank you for your attention. I know we went a little bit over and I'll uh, just say uh, Oregon Wine Month in May, we're all proud of it. And hopefully you go out there and enjoy the wines and sell a whole bunch for us. Thank you, Melissa. I don't know if you intentionally have all those poppies in the background, but they, you know, they, <laughs> they, they scream this time of the year. And so they, they look just beautiful. I have to, um, I, 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 I love the, the, the growth of women in the industry. When I got started and applied for my first internship, they were happy to have me, but of course I wasn't allowed to drive the forklift because <laughs> girls, girls, girls couldn't drive forklifts. Well, we changed that within about 24 hours, as you can, as you can imagine. And I still love driving a forklift. So um, that sort of wraps it us, up for us today. Um, we can't thank you enough for your attention uh, during this period of time. And, we hope this is a reminder and a catalyst for you to put all those Oregon wines in your bag and take them out and pour them with the same kind of love and passion that we, uh, that we use when, when we make them. Um, I can't thank my August uh, colleagues enough here for taking their time this morning to, to join us and talk about their, their brands, the things that are so close to their heart. I want to thank Justin King, who really uh, started this uh, idea and grabbed this ragtag group of people and, and sort of beat, it, beat us around until we were reasonably organized. And uh, Carrie, thank you for your IT brilliance. It was really helpful this morning. We have a, a small video that we're going to uh, play here at the back of this. If there are any questions, um, we are delighted to take them. And uh, Justin has a question. I can see his hand going. <laughs> Sorry, I just want to interject really fast. You know, with, thank you, Eugenia. And we've got, you know, a great program running with RNDC for Oregon Wine Month this year, this May, and going forward. It's, it's a commitment that RNDC is making to Oregon and to Oregon Wine Month. So, um, you know, that's a, big, that's a big part of what we want to connect you all with is, uh, is, is that piece. So just keep an eye out for that and, uh, and thank you. Yeah, thank you, RNDC. Thank you for your time. See you back here in Oregon. Right. Thanks, Eugenia. Hi there, I'm Elizabeth Clark, Director of Education and Experience for Adelsheim Vineyard. Oregon has so much to celebrate this year. Oregon is about heritage and place. Adelsheim Vineyard is taking part in this celebration by tipping our hat to 50 years in the Chehalem Mountains, being stewards of the land and creating a legacy in this ABA we call home. Celebrate with us this May, because May is Oregon Wine Month. Hello, welcome to Domain Durant, Oregon, here in the Willamette Valley, and welcome to Oregon Wine Month. You know, Oregon is uh, about community. We think of the community of winemakers, but it's on so many different layers. And one thing that matters maybe most to us is the community of vineyard workers and programs like Salude uh, happen to be holding this nine liter bottle of uh, the Salude Cuvée from the 2019 vintage, uh, one lucky winner Oh, bought that um, to raise money for the Salute program. And, and what's special about it, in addition to the work that it does, uh, raising money for vineyard worker health care and dental care, but it's just another great example of Oregon winemakers working together uh, to do something super positive for community. Hi. I'm Eugenia Keegan, General Manager for Oregon Jackson Family Wines, and I'm here to introduce you to Ramona. 
What's special about Ramona? She's electric. She's all electric every day, all day. And Ramona is just part of sustainability at Jackson Family Wines. And that's very important to us. It's one of our core values. What else is important to us? Great wine. And that's what we do in Oregon. We make great wine. We drink it all the time, maybe every day. We should like you to drink it every day too. But if you can't, please drink it in May. May is Oregon Wine Month. Join us, raise a toast to Oregon. Thank you. At King Estate, sustainability has been a core belief since the early days. Uh, we were certified organic in 2002, and then we expanded that certification in 2016 to include biodynamic, which now makes King Estate the largest certified biodynamic vineyard in North America. Uh, you know, our approach in winemaking has always been grow great fruit and get out of the way. Let the vintage and the variety express itself. Oregon is community. Every year, King Estate donates thousands of pounds of fruit and vegetables from our estate gardens to our local food bank. In response to the pandemic, King Estate established its own CSA, providing food for our employees and their families. May is Oregon Wine Month. Cheers. Cheers. I'm standing in the Rex Hill Vineyard, which is in the Chehalem Mountains AVA, and now inside one of the newest AVAs in the Willamette called Laurelwood, which is a nested AVA within the Chehalem Mountains. I'm actually on Laurelwood soil, which is where the AVA gets its name. Oregon is known for sustainability. Here at Rex Hill, we farm biodynamically, which means we're using plant preparations to promote holistic exchange in the vineyard. Oregon is known for its high standards. While most of the U.S. wine growing regions require a scant 75% of any label varietal on bottle, Oregon law requires 90%. Oregon's long, cool growing season and beautiful, long summer days allow for full flavor development and complexity in spades. So effectively, if it's from Oregon and says it's a Pinot, it's Pinot. May is Oregon Wine Month. Oregon is sustainability. Alex Sokolblosser here with my sister. Who are you? Who am I? I'm Allison Sokolblosser. Yeah, we're here right here, Sokolblosser Vineyards. We are certified organic by the uh, Oregon Department of Ag. A lot of vineyards in Oregon are certified organic, biodynamic, live, some third party certification that says that they care about the earth. So not only that, but we have some solar panels here at Sokol Blosser. Solar panels are not that uncommon at Oregon wineries as well, but sustainability, it's something that we care about as Oregonians. We're tree huggers. We are. Where's that tree? That's a post. Close enough. All right. Oregon has history. We are living proof as one of the pioneering wine families in Oregon that it, we've got deep roots here, not just with our history, but also with our vines. Our parents started in 1971. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, and we're really proud to be part of the history of the Oregon wine industry. May is Oregon Wine Month. Cheers. Woohoo! Hi, I'm Gary Mortensen, president of the Stoller Wine Group. Oregon is well known for its sustainability, and here at the Stoller Wine Group, we take our B Corps certification very seriously. Because to us, it doesn't just mean our sustainability in the vineyard. It means how we care for our employees and how we take care of our community. So please join us in raising a glass and cheering Oregon Wine Month in May. Cheers. Oregon is innovation. From canned wine to canned cocktails, at Union Wine Company, we've been working for the last 15 years to bring Oregon wine to your table. May is Oregon Wine Month. Cheers. Oregon is women in wine. Here at Willamette Valley Vineyards, we are proud to have 54% of our staff and 62% of our leadership team made up of passionate women leading the way in Oregon wine. Women have long led the way in the Oregon wine industry, with many of the founding families full of strong, independent women. Continuing on this tradition, we are a supporter of women in wine, fermenting change in Oregon, dedicated to advancing and supporting women in all facets of the wine industry. May is Oregon Wine Month. Yay!
It's a wrap. <laughs> it's a wrap. Official. Thank you. That everybody. was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for thanks for sticking around with us, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Have a great yeah. weekend. That was great. Thanks so much. See thanks, you next Cheers. Friday. Thanks, Eugenia. You're welcome. Everybody. Great fun. Thank, Thank you, guys. Enjoy. Take care.